Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces is now open and in session. God save the United States of America and this honorable court. Thank you. Please be seated. The first case this morning is the United States versus Maxwell. Counsel, Mr. Spinner, you ready to go forward? You may proceed. Good morning. May it please the court, I am Frank J. Spinner, and I am here to represent the appellant in this case, Colonel James Maxwell. I want to begin just by commenting that uh, my able co-counsel from the Air Force, Captain Richard Desmond, uh, is not with me today. He was recently uh, reassigned to teach at the United States Air Force Academy. This case was tried in January uh, 1993 in Texas. It relates to allegations uh, stating that the appellant used the services of electronic mail on America Online to transmit and receive uh, child pornography and obscene matters in violation of federal statutes as incorporated uh, under Article 134 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. There are also allegations related to communicating indecent language also by use of electronic mail and that's uh, listed as a vi was listed as a violation of Article 133 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, conduct on becoming an officer and a gentleman. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. That was Article 134, not 133. Um, he pled not guilty to all the charges, and a number of issues were litigated at trial. Those, those issues were reviewed by the Air Force Court of Military uh, Review. Uh, they basically denied relief, and uh, we are now here. The uh, court below did find that your client had a reasonable expectation of privacy uh, in, in transmitting on America Online, did he? Did right. He well, there were two aspects to the question, the, uh, whether he had a subjective expectation of privacy and whether he had an objective expectation of privacy. Uh, they essentially found that he had both. But they said that the, the search warrant overcame his expectation of privacy. That's correct. And that's why they admitted the evidence. Is that that is correct, Your Honor. Uh, do you think the expectation of privacy in this case is similar to the expectation of privacy when you make a telephone call, say from you and I are talking on the telephone? I, I've lived with this case for four years and I've tried to come up with what is an appropriate analogy. Uh, it is something like a telephone call, but it is not sufficiently like a telephone call. It, it seems to me to be sort of a mix of a telephone call and a, a, a letter or uh, something you would place in writing in the mail. To me, in a telephone call, if, if I know that you are not taping it, my words disappear as soon as you receive it on the telephone. But to me, and so I would have more of an expectation of right in a phone conversation than I would when I'm putting my message to you in a medium that, that can store, and, 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 and the words don't disappear when you receive it. That, in part, is true, but it fails to recognize the fact that the person at the other end of the line can record the telephone conversation, and That's they true. can, in effect, store that uh, for their own use. So, That's true. Uh, electronic mail, in that sense, uh, may or may not be stored by someone somewhere. It also depends uh, whether you're using a service like uh, uh, America Online, uh, whether or not you're using some sort of... Uh, a network within a business or otherwise. So there are a lot of uh, different factors that go into consideration as to whether or not any given communication in whatever form can be stored. Now, how did uh, th this all came about by a someone in California, we'll call him Mr. D, the, the name is in the record, Mr. D called and, and reported that someone was using America Online for indecent purposes. 
Uh, how did he get, did he get download into his computer and then send a disk to America Online, or? Well, at, at some point, he did provide that information to America Online uh, through uh, his electronic mail, and he was a subscriber to America Online. Uh, but he also provided a disk uh, to an agent, uh, Roland, with the FBI, which apparently contained some of the, uh, the graphic images which were transmitted over America Online. So, the images that Mr. D got, did they wind up as part of uh, the prosecution exhibit, I think it's one and two on the images of, of the alleged you know, child pornography here? I, I'm not sure, and the reason that I want to say I'm not sure is because Mr. D, uh, when he testified at trial, could not recall which images he put on the disk. Ah, okay. And so uh, his, he, he did provide some images on disk, he also sent electronic mail, and I think images essentially were attached to that electronic mail. But whether the images on the disk were the images uh, uh, transmitted through electronic mail to the uh, vice president of America Online is, I don't think that's clear in the record. Right. In fact, there seems to have been some confusion. Follow up to a couple of the questions that Judge Sullivan asked. Isn't the transmission uh, more akin to uh, facts? where you use a telephonic signal to... Well, the, the distinction between facts is you have a written document that goes in one end and you have a written document that comes out the other end. Electronic mail may never be put on paper. I mean, that's one of the nice things about it, I suppose, is that you just uh, you, you, uh, type it into your computer, you see it in, on your screen, uh, you send it to someone else, they see it on their screen, but nothing uh, is found in writing. In fact, I think what is intriguing about this case in one respect is that no uh, physical photographs were seized from the appellant's home, no physical uh, photographs were seized from America Online. Everything is, uh, was pretty much uh, uh, present in cyberspace, if you want to call it that. Um, the, the images were all viewed on a computer monitor by someone at some point. Uh, the only physical representations of what was viewed are those which were admitted as exhibits, and in fact, that was the basis for our best evidence uh, uh, issue. I get, the other follow-up question I wanted to ask is uh, with regard to uh, how Mr. D got access to this. It's my understanding that if it's communicated under a screen name and to someone else under another screen name, that that should ensure some type of uh, exclusionary uh, exclusion of others to act as far as access to that information. Do we know how Mr. D obtained this information? My recollection is that he obtained it from another subscriber to America Line. First of all, Mr. D was a subscriber. He received, uh, I, think, I think he may have received just about everything from another subscriber who went under the screen name of Champ One. And of course it's intriguing because uh, Champ One, in the process of obtaining, of obtaining the search, uh, authorization uh, was never identified. The FBI made no attempt to determine Champ One's identity. Uh, they, uh, and in fact, did not uh, uh, determine his identity, although Mr. Deeds at trial testified to Champ One's identity. Uh, and they made no attempt to establish Champ One's reliability. Uh, in fact, I recall when we, when we cross-examined the FBI, or, or examined the FBI agents on that point, uh, at least I think it was Mr. Garrett, the uh, FBI agent who provided the affidavit for the warrant, uh, said that he just felt it wasn't uh, necessary. Uh, Could Champ One be a law enforcement personnel? Champ One, yes. And, and what was really bothersome to me about Champ One was the fact that he, uh, and, and I'm saying he because we subsequently learned that he was a he, uh, sent these images to a lot of the subscribers identified in the warrant. It wasn't that they sent things to him. He sent these images to them, and then they used what he sent to others as a basis to search those others' uh, electronic mail. And so it seems to me the reliability of CHAMP-1 is, uh, is very critical to uh, well, counsel, establishing problem of cause. Counsel, uh, and with due respect to my colleagues' questions, uh, 
This case to me has two, at the outset, has two important questions. The first one is the scope of your client's rights of privacy under the Fourth Amendment and to police intrusion into his computer, his computer world, his communications, and so forth. And secondly, the rights he would have as a military officer vis-a-vis -a, -vis a search authorized by a subordinate as opposed to an independent judge, a neutral and detached magistrate within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. And is there any meaningful distinction there? Uh, could you tell me exactly how, okay, they got the material from Mr. D. Based upon that, the, the FBI went and obtained a warrant. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, in anticipation of that warrant, as I understand it, America Online prepared some 1,200 pages. 12,000. I'm sorry, 12,000 12, pages of material and some 30-odd discs. High-density discs. Yeah. Now, isn't that unusual? Doesn't the FBI normally seize the software and the computers and search themselves for what is identified in the warrant as opposed to a general search? I, I think it's highly unusual. Uh, I mean, and th this search could have encompassed all of the customers of America online, could it not have? Conceivably, it could have. As I argued in my brief, Champ One could have sent these messages to anyone he wanted. At the time, I think America Online had uh, some 200,000 or so uh, subscribers. Uh, I'm not sure what they're up to now, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's a But my point or... is, from a legal pr perspective of this court, how can we define, if the FBI has information probable cause that a crime is being committed, and I know you wouldn't concede that, but if they have information that a crime is being committed via email, let's say someone is plotting a drug transaction versus this type of thing, and they have probable cause to believe it exists, how do they, do have they employ America online to do the search for them? I would, would like to think that they would not. In fact, if they were going into, say, a bulletin board service as opposed to someone like America, I mean, American Line is almost is is a uh, sort of a third party in a sense. It's 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 their property that's being searched, but it's being searched for property that essentially uh, belongs to others. The information, if you want to. Uh, are, are there any cases throughout the country that define the scope of a search of a computer software by the FBI? The definitions have to. I mean, what I, the warrant has to contained and who can do it and how they do it? I, I don't think so. We cited in our brief the guidelines which has, have, have been issued by the Justice Department. And I think if you read those guidelines and read some of the cases cited in there, uh, you'll find that the warrant in this case uh, was obtained and executed in, uh, in contradiction to those guidelines. But those guidelines were not in effect at the time that uh, Mr. Garrett obtained the uh, uh, search warrant. But I guess that's one of the things that surprised me was that Mr. Garrett never attempted, apparently, to consult his own computer crime people in the FBI to determine what their limits were or to uh, go to the Department of Justice to, to consult with attorneys who may have had expertise in Co this area. Counsel, there's a threshold question here that the court below did not address, and that is, was this in the first instance a government search? The Fourth Amendment only protects against government searches and seizures. Th that's and it correct. seems to me that the employee from America Online kind of uh, jumped the gun here he, he and ran the, the search gun. knowing that a warrant would probably be coming, be forthcoming, but he jumped the gun. And is that not a private search? Or what factors would you point to right. to show that he was a government agent? The, uh, in, in his uh, testimony, he basically said, we obtained what they wanted. He sat down with, and in his testimony, he says he sat down with Brad Garrett in advance of the obtaining of the search warrant to discuss what could be retrieved and how it could be retrieved. And he basically uh, said that this is what the FBI wanted, that he understood that the FBI, Brad Garrett, was taking this electronic mail, these message strings, uh, which were sent to Gene Villanueva, the vice president at America Online. And uh, from those message strings, Brad Garrett was going to extract the names of the users, the screen names, and prepare a warrant. Um, Mr. Seraf, the, the vice president who actually, of America Online who actually extracted this information from their computers, said he did everything at the direction of the FBI. 
So while his actions uh, were taken before uh, Mr. Garrett showed up with the warrant to execute the warrant, it was with the understanding that a warrant was being obtained to seize that information. So I think clearly... Was the FBI present when he did the search? No, he, they were not present. Uh, clearly, Seraph was acting as an agent of the FBI. He was not acting in his own did private capacity. Did the FBI capacity. ask him to do the search yes. in advance of the warrant? Well, I don't know if they asked him to do the search, but uh, it seems to me at some point, I think an, an assistant United States attorney or someone faxed may have faxed a copy of the warrant to Mr. Seraph before Mr. Garrett uh, got there. But Mr. Garrett testified that when he got there, the search had, had been accomplished in effect, and, and all he did was pick up the 12,000 to 14,000 pages plus the 39 uh, high-density disk. Uh, again, uh, the whole point, when you, re when you look at the history of how this came about, initially they talked about getting a subpoena versus a search warrant. Uh, and I think the attorneys at, uh, at America Online, talking to attorneys uh, either with the U.S. Attorney's Office or the Department of Justice, uh, determined that that was not an appropriate uh, method to do it. Uh, and so they, uh, it, was, it was the understanding all along that America Online had no authority on their own. In fact, it, I think it violated the Electronic uh, Communications Privacy Act as well as their terms of agreement with their, uh, with their subscribers, for them to go in and just grab this electronic mail on their own. So I, th I think it's pretty clear in the record, when you read it in context, that they, whatever they did, they, it may have been a little premature before the warrant was executed, but they were doing it because that was what the FBI wanted. Uh, I, and I don't think that you can say in any way, shape, or form that Mr. Seraph acted on his own. Uh, and in, in response to what the information they got from America Online, the FBI, then turned over the information uh, related to your client to the OSI, which is the Air Force Office of Special, Special Investigations, yes. And what did they do with it? Well, first of all, uh, Garrett turned over the entire 12,000 to 14,000 pages, which is rather surprising since Colonel Maxwell was the only uh, Air Force member, I think, that was identified, only military member. In fact, I think he's the only one of the whole group that's ever been prosecuted. Uh, but the, uh, the uh, OSI then took that information to, uh, I think it was Colonel McHenry, who was the vice commander who served under my client, and uh, acting as a, a military magistrate, uh, he issued a search authorization to search my client's personal computer in his home. And I want to make clear for the record that, that uh, the appellant was a private subscriber to America Online, that the computer, while it was in his quarters on base, it was a, a personal computer. There was no connection between uh, his use of America Online and his military duties. Okay. How does a military magistrate established in the Air Force? Uh, essentially, they're uh, uh, by regulation and by a <coughs> by special appointment. Uh, does the appellant contend that, that, this, that he had no authority to to order a search under the military rules of evidence? We not have not. about the Constitution, under military rules of evidence. Right. While it is rather unusual to have a subordinate commander uh, serving as a military magistrate, magistrate issuing a search of his uh, immediate commander's uh, property, we made no argument that this relationship per se disqualified him from acting. And we had some other problems with how he went about authorizing the search, but, but we didn't have well, a problem. What are those problems? Well, essentially, uh, he did not have a clue, as some people would say, what he was doing. He was not familiar with the, uh, the, uh, the statutes involved. He did not understand uh, the issues surrounding probable cause and as they relate to First Amendment, uh, First Amendment type questions where uh, it is incumbent upon a magistrate to ensure that the, uh, the uh, searching officers are very careful to comply with the terms of the warrant, uh, particularly with respect to the obscenity allegations. In this case, uh, there was no attempt by Colonel McHenry to define obscenity, to tell the uh, uh, officers what they could seize and what they could not seize. And I think the Supreme Court law, uh, federal law, is very clear that in this area, uh, you must state with uh, scrupulous uh, uh, 
uh, specificity in the warrant what is to be seized, and you're not to leave discretion to the searching authorities. This is the doctrine of prior restraint. I, I would say that. Or whatever it was called in early days. You can't restrain something as being obscene till you determine it is obscene. Yes. Kind of a catch-22. It's kind of a catch-22, but, but in this case, there was no attempt in any way, shape, or form but didn't, to didn't deal with Mc, these didn't issues. Didn't Colonel McHenry actually have photographs, I mean, not photographs, but uh, graphic depictions of what they were to seize? He, he had graphic depictions, and we, we had a little test with him to... I'm going to give you some more time because of that. Yes, sure. interrupted you. We had a little test because uh, he had no standard. He was not familiar with Miller versus California. He was not, he didn't seem to appreciate the standard for determining what was obscene. So here you have OSI agents coming to a military magistrate, and, and basically the, the, I think the military magistrate is the one standing between the police and, and, the, and the citizen, even in, in a military environment, a military citizen. Uh, so it was incumbent upon him to determine probable cause by applying the proper standards for child pornography and obscenity, uh, child pornography under 18 U.S.C. 2252, and, uh, and obscenity under the standards enunciated by the Supreme Court. He didn't crack open a book. He didn't even consult the lawyer who was sitting there with him when he was making this determination. I believe, counsel, there are findings of fact to the contrary. Uh, the, the military judge found that he consulted with a staff judge advocate. The court below found that he had been briefed. I mean, right. there is an opposite the, argument to right. the argument and you clearly, just made. Those findings are clearly erroneous. Uh, when you read Colonel McHenry's testimony, he did not consult with a, a staff judge advocate while he was making that decision. He, I think he says a staff judge advocate or a judge advocate was present, but he did not consult him. I don't think that there was any conversation at all. On issue six, and that's the instructions, the judge uh, actually instructed the jury here that, that they had, that in order to convict your client, that, that they had to be sure he knew or believed that the persons in, in prosecution, the exhibits, uh, were minors, were under 18 years old. That's correct. All right. The Supreme Court in the, uh, I guess it's uh, United States, States versus Excitement, which is a 1994 case, Excitement video, uh, held that that was, um, that's here. Uh, I'm sure you agree with that. Uh, well, in fact, it was interesting because Excitement video had not been decided by the Supreme Court. And so we did file a petition for extraordinary relief uh, because we saw some conflicts uh, in that area, and we, we wanted to challenge what was going on. Uh, judge judge uh, Weir, who was the trial judge, uh, I think was anticipating, in general, the direction that he thought that the Supreme Court may go in that issue uh, by coming up with the instruction that he did. But his instruction seemed to contradict a prior law by the Air Force Court of uh, Military Review, as it was <coughs> called at that time. In any event, our position certainly is when he says knew or believed that that is not a proper instruction. I don't know what instructions. Now, there was no objection to that instruction, was there? I think we objected to the. Uh, the general instruction? Or believed language of the instruction. Because we weren't, it wasn't clear to us exactly what that meant to say believed. Uh, someone I don't think there was an objection, though, to the other instructional error that you alleged as to the community right, that right. should judge the question of obscenity. Th that's correct. So and to give relief in that area, we'd have to find that that was plain error. Uh, yes, you would, but I, we cited uh, in the cases, I went back and looked at, uh, especially on the issue of young or old, uh, looking at the Bush decision out of the Fifth Circuit and the Pincus decision, the courts it's not clear that they tested for harm in those cases when those instructions were given. And I, I just checked that yesterday to satisfy myself that they did not do a harmless error analysis. Well, I was concerned that we hadn't given the appellant quite enough time to all the issues in the case, but you'll have some time on uh, 
rebuttal. Any other questions from the judges? Well, you'll have time for rebuttal, Mr. Sure. Mayor. Thank you. Major Peterson. Thank you. May it please the court, I'm Major Peterson, and along with Colonel Infelice, I represent the United States here today. Appellant's expectation of anonymity while he openly practiced widespread dissemination and active solicitation of child pornography and obscenity via America Online with third parties cannot be equated to a legitimate expectation of privacy afforded Fourth Amendment protection. Appellant voluntarily and intentionally placed this material on the information highway with the express purpose of having strangers pick it up and further disseminate it. It is patently unreasonable to suggest he intended this to remain private. If we look at what appellant was doing, and it's, it's in the record at Appellate Exhibit 11, Attachment 1, which was the information that Mr. Dietz turned over to the FBI, that appellant was receiving and transmitting child pornography and obscenity. He was doing so behind the shield of a screen name, but he was doing so openly. He was transmitting to numerous individuals, and all of those people were aware that appellant, through his screen name, was the one doing it because it was on the message traffic as the from person. Wasn't he part of a network of, of individuals using these screen names to, to, to talk about Yes, uh, sir. Sexual matters? Yes, sir. If you look at the message traffic, it is clear that there was a group of individuals identified by their screen names who were actively engaged in this practice. Um, and Champ One was one of those? Yes, sir. Okay. And Champ One, contrary to appellant's assertion here during argument, Champ One was not only transmitting to appellant. If you look at the message traffic in Appellate Exhibit 11, Attachment 1, it is obvious that Ready One was reciprocating and returning information and visual depictions, obscenity and child pornography back to Champ One voluntarily and intentionally um, and explicitly following up on his requests to only send him uh, pictures of young men under the age of 16. Well, Prosecution Exhibit 2F, as in Foxtrot, uh, it was a, a email uh, from Ready One, uh, the appellant, uh, appellant uh, to Champ One with, let's see, one, two, three, about uh, 10 or 11 CCs. Yes, so, sir. so that means that went to not all just Champ people. One, but to all of them. And, and, and he said in it, don't forget, in, in other words, don't forget to me when you're sending out good stuff. So he's right. part of an exchange. Right. He was actively group. soliciting return of this sort of information. And I would suggest that appellant's behavior in this case is akin to a flasher or exhibitionist who wears a mask. Does that individual intend for his conduct to be private? Absolutely not. He goes forth in public, displays his conduct, intending, expecting, and wanting others to see it. But only others who are interested in seeing it. Not necessarily. These people did not know who they were dealing with. They were sending it out. I, I know, but they were in, uh, according to the record, as I understood it, they were in, you said the information highway, they had taken a side street off the information highway into a culvert where people of like interests Certainly. came to find out the information. Certainly. They were trading and within a group of individuals who had made it clear they were Where in the record can I find a search warrant authorizing the search of Ready One? Where in the search warrant? Um, it is in Attachment One. The government would assert that the transposition or the typographical error changing ready one into red L, the one to an L is simply a typographical error and it still justifies. It could be a typographical error, but in the information highway in the world of cyberspace, you could not have gotten in there with the search warrant, could you? Certainly. Um, so it's, the, it's a critical error. Well, the government would suggest it wasn't. Got to keep in mind that this search warrant was done back in 1991. It was apparently one of the first to be done. So DOJ guidelines that are 
in public now for guidance to turn to on how to do this weren't available. Uh, it's obvious from the record that Agent Garrett did not fully understand all of the ins and outs of the computer world or computer language. He testified that it was an unintentional error. He did not recognize that he had transposed this number into a letter. So it's the government's position that it was simply a, a typographical error and it does not invalidate the warrant. But getting back to my hypothetical about the flasher or exhibitionist with a mask, they are out in public plying their trade, like appellant was, actively sending this information forward to the other individuals, but he was hiding behind his screen name. And hiding behind a screen name suggests he wanted to be anonymous, not that he wanted to be private. In fact, it's clear he did not want his conduct to be private because then he couldn't actively solicit this information in return. Well, Even the question, it's, and, and you're making, as usual, an excellent argument, but the question doesn't seem to me to turn on whether he wanted his conduct to be private within this sphere that he was dealing, but whether it is protected. Well, as the Supreme... And, and we're dealing with a novel question. Certainly. What protection do people who are entering into this cyberspace or whatever the world is, the information highway, what protection, if any, are they entitled to? And if the answer to that is none, so be it. Then we should know that. But if the answer is there is there is some protection, then it seems that it's imperative to our court to decide what protection military members have who want to communicate with others, expressing, uh, this one becomes critical because it's child pornography alleged, but what if it's something else that's just offensive? Right. Like well, they're interested, what if the people are interested in swastikas? Can we have a general search of everybody online in America to decide how many military members are, are interested in Nazi paraphernalia? I doubt it. And I think you can turn to long-standing constitutional law and Supreme Court opinions to find your answer. Um, it is clear from Katz, the seminal case on the Fourth Amendment protections and, and the progeny, that what an individual knowingly exhibits to the public is not afforded Fourth Amendment protection. And I think it is critical to a, a determination in this case to apply the Supreme Court's case in Miller regarding bank records, where most people, if you ask them, would say, yeah, I have an interest in my bank records to keep it private, but the Supreme Court has said no. When you voluntarily turn over that sort of information to a third party, it is no longer within your control. You cannot control its further dissemination. There is no expectation of privacy. And if you look at why that's important, it's because Congress took that decision and promulgated the Right to Financial Privacy Act, which stepped in and filled the void. And they granted individuals a certain privacy interest in that information that the Constitution would not protect. And we have the same thing here because Congress promulgated the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, citing specifically Miller Bank Records case and the Right to Financial Privacy Act, arguably the same thing. We are going to step in and provide a statutory right to protection which the Constitution does not otherwise cover because of these technological advances. Now, the court below held that, that, that the, the appellant here had expectation of privacy in his email. Right. And, and you disagree with that? Yes. But even if we rule against you, uh, there was a proper search warrant. You Absolutely. know, I have an expectation of privacy in my home. However, if I do something, uh, you know, commit a crime in my home and it's reported and there's probable cause for a met judge to, to, to issue a warrant, even though I have expectation of privacy in my home, the warrant will overcome that. Right. And isn't that what we have here? Right. I mean, there was, you know, you know, the law of the case right now is that there is an expectation of privacy, but, but, but there was a warrant here. Right. And, uh, and Assuming that's a valid warrant, then, then whether the appellant has an expectation of privacy or not, you know, it's overcome by the warrant that was issued. Right. right. And obviously it's the government's position that the warrant was valid 
because uh, there was a report of a federal law, the child pornography law, and that is the basis upon which the judge issued the warrant. Right. The, okay. the federal magistrate was um, deciding whether there was a... Their names are federal magistrate judge now. Federal magistrate judge. It's been judge changed by law. It was <laughs> determining whether there was probable cause to believe that a violation of 18 U.S.C. 2252 had occurred and evidence would be found in this location or these locations. Um, and it is clear that there was probable cause to determine that a violation of the statute had occurred. Mr. Dietz turned over the information to Ms. Villanueva, the uh, America Online Vice President, who subsequently turned it over to the FBI. It tracked the message strings, it attached the graphic pictures, the obscenity, the child pornography. If you look at Appellate Exhibit 11, Attachment 1, that's the information that was turned over by Mr. Dietz to America Online. If you look at the gifts that are contained therein, those are the ones that Mr. Dietz turned over to the FBI, and those are the very same ones that the FBI attached to their application for the warrant for the magistrate to review. If you look at that information, it is patently obvious that they are children in lewd and lascivious poses and indecent and obscene um, photographs, naked, exposing their genitals, touching their penises together, and what have you. So clearly there was probable cause to believe that a violation of 18 U.S.C. 2252 did occur and that those mailboxes would contain evidence of that crime. Um, appellant has argued that the uh, transcription of a 1 into an L invalidates the warrant. The government's position is that it does not. First of all, it was simply a typographical error, but in any event... Well, the FBI affidavit described the appellant as ready one and ready one, uh, and the, the magistrate you know, uh, it was, you know, was issuing that. America Online knew who they were trying to get. There was just a typographical error. The, the warrant listed in attachment A, I believe, Red L, R-E-D-D-E-L, all in capital letters. Instead the of one was transcribed into an L and capitalized. Um, the, the FBI agent did not recognize a distinction or a problem with doing that. It was simply, in his mind, a typographical error. Um, on, another, on another issue, I know you only have a limited amount of time, but uh, this is an issue on the, the right of, of the appellant to get a fair trial. Uh, there seems to be some problem with the instructions. Would you address your position on the, the instruction of the judge when he told the jury, instructed him, they must be convinced that, that the appellant knew or believed that the persons depicted were under 18 of age. This is exhibit, or uh, issue six. Right, regarding 18 U.S.C. 2252. Right. Well, clearly the Supreme Court has upheld the constitutionality of the statute in excitement video. If you look at the case law which is cited in our brief that has analyzed 2252 and excitement video subsequent to that opinion, they focus on what that knowingly means. And they say that a person does not have to know the explicit age of any of the performers or individuals depicted. What they have to know and be aware of is the general nature of the material that it contains child pornography. So when the military judge instructed the members that they had to know or believe this was child pornography, that in and of itself is sufficient to satisfy the scienter requirement of the statute. So the military judge's instruction was not incorrect. It is patently obvious when you look at the photos in conjunction with the instruction that uh, appellant would have to be e exhibiting reckless disregard to the obvious to suggest that they did not contain Minors. Well, he, he used terms in some of the email uh, transmitting this to like uh, boy and things like. I mean, he didn't use men. And right, and and specifically, Champ One sent out a message saying, "Please only send me pictures of boys under the age of 16." 
The day after Ready One received that message, he reciprocated, sent one to Champ One and said, here's one I think you'll like. That is in the record and you can trace the names to find out which picture it is and it is clear from the graphic that it is a minor. Uh, but the case law has said that they are not going to require a more stringent requirement under 2252 in the scienter requirement than for obscenity of adults, and that is that the person has to be aware of the general nature of the material and the instruction properly covered that. Council, I'd like to clarify a point that came up earlier. Um, we specified the issue of whether or not appellant had a reasonable expectation of privacy, did we not? That's correct. So there is no law of the case doctrine or any other doctrine that would bar us from disagreeing with the court below, should we so find? I would agree with that position, ma'am, and I would also suggest that because it is inextricably tied to the two issues that you did grant on the search warrant and the search authorization, that again, the question is not law of the case uh, regarding what the Air Force Court did. And consequently, the military judge at trial found that appellant had a subjective expectation of privacy because of his testimony, um, but did not have an objective expectation of privacy because of his widespread dissemination and lack of control of this information after he sent it forward. The Air Force Court found that he did have an objective contrary to the judge's position, but in any event, we had a valid search warrant and a valid search authorization for the information that was seized. Do you concede that this was a government search? Um, I think we need to because if you look at the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, um, what Mr. Sarif did was not prohibited by anything. The, if you look at the structure of the ECPA, the service provider is not precluded or prohibited from access. And if you'll note in section 2703A, the government requires a warrant to force disclosure by the service provider, not to, f to get access by the service provider. Um, Mr. Sarif, the testimony is actually unclear as to what Mr. Sarif had obtained prior to the service of the warrant. If you look at the, the, a lot of the stuff that the government requested were business records, the account numbers and that sort of thing. And we would suggest under Miller, the bank records case, there's absolutely no expectation of privacy in that information. So this is the contents of the email that we need to focus on, but Mr. Sarif testified that he did not withdraw that email until he had the warrant. You'll note in the testimony of Agent Morrow that a copy of the warrant was data faxed to America Online. That may have been what Mr. Sarif used to run his utility program to seize the email, but it is fairly clear that he would not have done so without the court order. And again, contrary to appellant's assertion during argument, it is absolutely clear that Agent Garrett did confer with United States attorneys on the best way to approach this, how to do it, whether they had probable cause, and that testimony is in the record. But again, Agent Garrett's warrant was what triggered Mr. Sarif from uh, downloading and transmitting this information to the FBI. But again, if Mr. Sarif were doing this on his own, no, it would not be a government search and would not be covered by the Fourth Amendment. <clears throat> when we look at the warrant itself, it's the government's position that there was probable cause. But notwithstanding a valid warrant, if this court were to set that aside and determine there were no probable cause, it is absolutely clear that the agents and all those involved in this case acted in good faith reliance on that warrant. There was no reckless disregard for the truth of the information provided. Uh, they did not, they did what they could under the circumstances with what they knew. My, my, my recollection of the record is that the magistrate judge had actual graphic depictions of the type of material to be seized. Right. He, it, was, he was not it was not just being described to him. He actually could see it and judge for himself as to whether that may or may not be obscene. That's correct. He and whether was, that may or may not depict children. That's so, correct. He was given a, a brief description in the affidavit that it was visual depictions of children engaged in sexually explicit conduct and the GIFs or the graphic interchange formats provided by Mr. Dietz to America Online and the FBI were attached. 
so he could look at those himself and make the determination. But how did you prove a trial? How did the government prove a trial that uh, the uh, the transmission uh, was minor? They were minor boys. They were under 18. There was testimony from Doctor. Was it Chaston or Cheston? Or? To tell you the truth, sir, I don't recall the name. But, but there was a doctor, a medical doctor, that yes. said in in his expert, he was qualified as an expert, and said that these these young men or boys are under. Right, 18. and and in addition, they had the actual graphic photos, what have you, to, pictures to give to the members to look at, and it is clear that a number of the individuals are young children. Um, they have undeveloped musculature, a lack of pubic hair, very youthful faces. So it's clear when you look at those that they are children. Well, one last question from my, in my mind. We granted on issue nine whether the sentence to dismissal in this particular case would constitute uh, excessive or cruel and unusual punishment. Did you happen in your research to look at the federal sentence guidelines as to what a first offender for transmitting child pornography by email might expect to receive? No, I didn't, sir. But again, Getting the, the other charges of which he was convicted, the uh, indecent language charge, for example, would not be a federal offense under Title 18, would it not? I it don't would, believe so. It would it's strictly, it's uniquely a military offense. Right. It was an, a violation of Article 134, indecent language, service prejudicial to good order and discipline, and or service discredited. And to prove all of the elements of that, you have to infer the necessary intent from the subject of the language itself. They prove, they prove the language, so you have to infer the intent from that. I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, the government has to, what are the elements of indecent language under the Uniform Code of Military Justice? That the language itself um, is indecent. It corrupts morals and things of that nature and right. is made with intent. Does it have to be made with any intent to in, incite? lust or something like that? Well, that's all contained within the definition of indecent. Is it the type of, of material that, that applies to the prurient interests um, and that sort of thing? So that's all contained within the definition of indecent. Well, can I, one question that I had, and I, and I don't want to get into the actual language because it's before us, but if this were a private conversation between the two parties, <clears throat> in the privacy of their home. Would this be prosecutable under Article 134? It could be. The test that this court has applied in the past and must apply in this case is whether there is a clear and present danger that the language was honored under such circumstances as to bring about the evils which Congress sought to preclude, which under Article 134 is conduct prejudicial to good order and discipline or service discrediting. In this case, we have a senior officer uttering this language to a junior officer, um, fully explaining his sexual desires. Uh, well, Congress has spoken in this particular area and said that mere expression of those concepts is not an unlawful act in the military. It's the conduct itself that's unlawful. Haven't you? Right, but you, you can't divorce. You have to look at the circumstances to determine if it is prejudicial to good order and discipline under those circumstances. I think if we look at this court's opinion in Hartwig, an individual wrote an arguably private, lang private letter to a 13-year-old and tried to argue that there was some sort of First Amendment protection, and this court said, no, there's not. The military, while well, What if he had written that same letter to uh, a peer who reciprocated with similar letters? Right. What's the clear and present danger there? Right, but, but that's exactly my point, sir. You can't just say it is or it isn't. You have to look at the circumstances, kind of the totality of the circumstances to determine if there is a clear and present danger that this could be service discrediting or prejudicial to good order and discipline. This was charged under 134, but if you charged it under 133, it would be clear by this court's prior case law, specifically Moore and Hartwig, that this is the kind of conduct which would disgrace an officer and lower his standing in the eyes of his peers and clearly would be conduct unbecoming. Conduct unbecoming would per se be prejudicial to good order and discipline and service discrediting. So the same sort of analysis can be applied to 134 private speech. And this court has applied that test 
and those standards all the way back to United States versus Priest where they were looking at that more seditious type language, but they have established the test that is a clear and present danger test and it, and it is applicable here. And I think it is clear that the, that the problem with this kind of conduct and the 134 nature of the charge itself can be seen by relating it to the fraternization cases. But uh, do, in order for you to win your case on a, on a colonel talking to a, a lieutenant in explicit homosexual language, you know, uh, uh, don't you have to prove that these people knew that they were on active duty? Or they that they did. We did. Um, if you look at the, the information that was transmitted back and forth, um, appellant admitted to Launch Boy that this was the first time he admitted to everyone, anyone on active duty, that he had um, feelings of this nature. Um, his screen name in this instance was Zerlock. On one occasion, Launch Boy asked if his name read backwards had any significance. Uh, i.e. meaning rank, uh, which would be backwards Colonel Riz or C-O-L-R-I-Z, mm -hmm. and appellant replied back, yes, you're even close, which is why I need to be so discreet. He then goes on to detail what his assignments had been um, on MAGCOM staffs and air staffs, which any officer knows those types of positions are generally senior officers. Appellant knew that that Launch Boy was a lieutenant or a junior ranking officer because he was a missile launch officer. So it was clear that they knew the respective ranks or, or pretty that, close. That they knew before there was exchange of the, uh, of the talk of uh, physical contact with each other? Or did that come afterwards? Um, if you look at the letters, the first letter that contains the language that was charged, there are discussions within that letter. Um, which talk about their positions and, and active duty uh, status and that sort of thing. So it, in the very beginning, they did not know for sure, but as it developed, it was clear that they knew, and those, the letters that were charged were later in the relationship. The, the, the two email letters that they were charged came after they knew that or, sus, or suspected that each was on active duty? Yes, sir. If this, if this had been launch girl instead of launch boy, and Zerlock Zer had been communicating and exchanging sexual fantasies with her, uh, would that have been conduct prejudicial to good order and discipline when she was not of his command and all of that? Um, it could be because appellant was at all times married. Um, and again, we have adultery offenses, and we have that sort of thing under the guise of, again, conduct unbecoming, and it's the government's position that, yes, under the circumstances, it could be prejudicial to good order and discipline and service discrediting under Article 134. Could they communicate about uh, some abstract religious concepts or some uh, beliefs in... Uh, Maybe they were racist or something like that. Could they, could they have communications other than about homosexuality? Would that all fall under conduct prejudicial to good order and discipline too? Again, on the email? it would depend on what it was. So um, what you're saying is the colonel had no First Amendment rights in his conversation, period. In these, first, these conversations, absolutely not. Um, again, the, it, it's clear from Parker versus Levy on down that while the First Amendment applies to the military, we cannot acknowledge or refuse to acknowledge the military context. And there is certain information that simply is not provided First Amendment protection in the military. Have you ever found a case where the First Amendment protection was afforded a military member? We didn't cite any of them in our brief, but I, mean, I it didn't apply to the Air Force Rabbi Goldman right. who wanted to wear a yarmulke. Right. So certainly, it probably doesn't apply to a colonel who wants to have a sexual fantasy discussion, does it? Well, certainly, if someone just wants to discuss religious tenets with nothing else, no further circumstances which would make it discrediting, I would suggest that that very well may be protected by the First Amendment. Again, we don't have those facts. 
Under the facts that we have, it is clear that this is indecent language covered by Article 134, properly prosecutable, and the uh, convictions should be affirmed by this court. Um, getting back to the search authorization on base, it is not true that the magistrate had no clue what he was doing. If you look at the affidavits provided by the OSI agents, they explain what the statutes were, the lewd and lascivious exhibition of genitals of minors, obscene materials, and there are, are brief descriptions contained within the affidavit. I notice my time is up, thank you. Um, in addition, the graphic uh, photographs again were attached to the application to Colonel McHenry and he made it clear although in a layman's terms that he did understand the definition of probable cause and that he had had informal training on the matter. How, how does the military magistrate system work in the Air Force? Uh, they are appointed by the commander. It's governed by a, a series of regulations and he was properly appointed by a, appellant in this case. Um, and there was no objection that he did not have the authority to act in I'm such a position. I'm just asking this generally. So the commanding officer who normally under the rules has the search authorization authority can delegate that to a, a right. neutral detached person in his or her command. Right. And they issue search warrants and review pretrial confinement and things like that. Right. Is that the, do you, you recall the regulation number? No, we just trade, changed from regulations to instructions, so we have all new numbers, so I don't know what it is, but I can certainly... Was it your old, was it in the Judge Advocate series, you recall? I don't or recall. in the command series? But I will submit a, a supplemental well, we citation to the court on that number. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Any rebuttal? Yes, sir. Mr. Spinner, the ninth issue deals with the dismissal, which according to your uh, brief, uh, was the only punishment that your client received, but can be translated into a loss of not only retirement benefits for, for Colonel Maxwell, which according to your brief would be in excess of a million dollars, but likewise would deny a spouse and children of hospital benefits and and uh, survivor benefits and other things that a uh, person with more than 20 plus years in honorable service would be entitled to. Do you have any authority that would allow us to give you relief there? Or is this something just intuitive you're hoping we might do? Um, certainly I have no authority other than the cases I cited in the federal sector that re relate civil forfeitures to uh, excessive punishment. It's sort of like if you have a marijuana joint and you're smoking it in your house, and the government comes in and seizes your house, um, that certainly appears to be excessive considering you were just, you had a single marijuana joint. Now that's uh, obviously overstated. I, I haven't seen the case, but I heard on the radio last night that the Supreme Court had just made a, had, had refused to make a distinction between well, the civil consequences and the criminal consequences. For double jeopardy purposes. I understood that to be a double jeopardy case, and, and I'm not dealing with the je double jeopardy yeah, aspect well, of that. Do, do you have any idea what your client would have received had he been prosecuted in the United States District Court for violating 1822, whatever? Right. No, I, I did not. But he wouldn't have gotten a fine of over a million dollars. I, I don't. I think I can safely say he would not have received a fine of that magnitude. And additionally, he wasn't doing this for profit. He did not take these. Uh, there's no evidence that he uh, took these photographs. There's no evidence that he input them into America Online. All he did was tap in to things that were already being circulated. So even as you look at that issue, broader context of child pornography and, and how serious the offense was, he's just someone who discovered this on America Online and, and did, in fact, trade it with other people. But uh, in that sense, uh, I think it was a relatively minor uh, offense in the, in the broader context of, of child pornography in the statute. I, I want to make a few points in the limited time I have available that, that I think are critical to understanding this case and that unfortunately the Air Force Court failed to even address in their opinion, which I find astonishing. This is the search warrant. Mr. Seraf testified that two pages were served on America Online. 
the warrant, and the list of attachment A, the list of users. When you read the warrant, it makes no uh, statement about child pornography. It makes no statement about 18 United States Code, Section 2252. It makes no statement about uh, 18 U.S.C. 1465. There's no uh, affidavit incorporated by reference. This warrant says, sees everything. At least that's the way Mr. Sheriff interpreted it in your system connected with, with, uh, with these users. And it identifies some ADI users. Now, I think there's some duplication. In fact, as I, uh, uh, an exhibit an exhibit that we had at trial, Exhibit uh, 31B, uh, we listed all the names on the warrant. In pink, I've highlighted here the errors. <coughs> I mean, the government would like to make you think that Mr. Garrett was just not careful with respect to Red L and Ready One. Mr. Garrett was not careful at all. He made over 20 transcription errors of all ki and kinds of errors. He left names out. He added names. Some of these things do not relate to users at all. He misspelled some names. I mean, this was a very poorly uh, prepared document, and that needs to be understood. But in any event, Mr. Seraph interpreted this warrant to mean that he was supposed to obtain every electronic mail, uh, correspondence, however you want to describe it, for every one of these users. Now, it's significant that nowhere on here do you find Launch Boy. Nowhere on here do you find Zerlock. It's significant that Mr. Seraph said he could have devised a system to go in and just pull out pictures alone and then backtrack and, and accumulated the email related to those pictures. But he said Mr. Garrett didn't want that. Mr. Garrett <coughs> wanted everything. This warrant is overbroad on its face. It is a general warrant. It is prescribed by the Fourth Amendment. And there is no way to get around this warrant and this error. What uh, exhibit number is the warrant itself? The warrant itself is attachment three to appellate <coughs> exhibit 11. And I think what has happened in this case, the Air Force Court and the military judge had no understanding of federal search warrants. And so they just didn't deal with it. They have no experience with these, or they have very limited experience. Uh, two cases that we argued at the Air Force Court, and one is cited in my brief, and one is cited in uh, uh, the uh, government's brief, uh, Center Art Galleries, Hawaii versus United States, at 875 Fed 2nd, 747. And uh, in the matter of the application of Lafayette Academy, which is, uh, uh, I can't read, I think it's 610 Fed 2nd, 1. Both of these cases are must reading because they talk about the problems of overbroad warrants, of how you incorporate by reference an affidavit and the importance of making sure that a warrant states with sufficient particularity what is to be seized. The fact that you have to relate it to a federal offense. The fact that you have to be concerned in the First Amendment area about seizing property that is outside the scope of that offense. I, I also want to note, too, that uh, with respect to Judge Weir and what the government has argued, they say, well, look at all these messages and this networking. I said in my brief, Judge Weir's ruling flies in the face of uh, legislation and uh, circumvents its, purpose, its purposes by allowing email to be examined after it has been seized by the government in order to determine whether the Fourth Amendment covers it. And I cite Bumpers versus North Carolina, which says, any idea that a search can be justified by what turns up was long ago rejected in our constitutional jurisprudence. What the government wants you to do is to take all that they found and then come back and say what we did was justified without first looking at the issues in the abstract and saying what protections exist. And now, how do we craft a search warrant to, to uh, ensure that we don't violate the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment? 
And they simply didn't do that in this case. The government is further asking you to say, well, it's a new area. So we have to excuse this poor little FBI agent because he didn't know what he was doing. And we have to excuse the federal magistrate judge because this was a new area and he didn't know what he was doing. And we have to excuse the Air Force Court of Military Review because this is a new, it goes on and on. Well, it surprises me that this is a new area. The FBI has been searching computers for years, haven't they? Wasn't that where they developed evidence against Colonel Oliver North? They, they have computer, searched... Inter, inner office computer mail? Inner office is a key distinction. This case is uh, of precedent-setting value because it has to do with America Online, a national online computer service. It has to do with what privacy expectations a subscriber who uses this in a private capacity, uh, what, what uh, privacy interests they have. I don't know of any other case like this where you've had a search warrant obtained by the FBI through a federal magistrate judge uh, and uh, it was directed at the computers of an online computer service. I, have, I couldn't find one before I did this case and I, I don't know that I've well, found one since. It, if the FBI had probable cause to believe that uh, a conspiracy was going on between A, B, and C, and, and the conspiracy was being conducted via the Bell Atlantic telephone system. And they wanted to prove telephone calls between A, B, and C. Couldn't they issue, uh, have a judge issue a subpoena, subpoena ducas tecum for the bills of A, B, and C based upon probable cause and examine all of the, all of the phone calls to determine that there were... Well, you're so talking about... Connect the three? Right, establishing that the calls were made. But it, that's a far cry from determining what the content of the calls was. I'm with you. And we're, we're dealing here with content issues, obscenity issues. The other problem with this... So what you would suggest the FBI, if, if, since we're writing, according to you, on a clean slate, that the FBI would arm with probable cause that uh, people are communicating or, or transmitting child pornography... Well, first of all, you have to take... able to get the names and addresses, and then they have to go interview each one of those people to see if they can develop exactly what was done, and they're not allowed to seize what was done? I, I suggest that the best way for this court to analyze the problem and to, and to determine the issue is to start from scratch. Look at what Mr. Garrett had when he started and say, what could he have done with this? How should a warrant have been, an affidavit been drafted? How should the warrant then have been drafted to make sure that you were not giving Mr. Garrett unbridled discretion to seize whatever he wanted? And that's what happened here. 12,000 to 14,000 pages were seized from America Online. How, we have less than 20 exhibits in this case and not all of those are child pornography. This is, this is killing a mosquito with a sledgehammer. And, and it could have been done. And Mr. Seraph, when you read his testimony closely, he says it could have been done. Furthermore, even if by some argument you could say that the affidavit that Mr. Garrett provided was in fact attached and incorporated by reference into the warrant, which it was not, because it was not served on uh, America Online. But even if you could say that, it only relates to child pornography. If it only relates to child pornography, then why are they seizing 12,000 to 14,000 pages of electronic mail? Couldn't the magistrate have done something to ensure that they were not violating uh, the First Amendment rights of subscribers of America Online? He made no effort to like limit the search. What would he do to, to, to do that? Right. Mr. Seraph said that they could have constructed a, a program or a way to just, first of all, bring pictures out. Now, then the magistrate could have said, okay, here's the definition for child pornography under 18 U.S.C. 2256. Now, you must only seize those pictures that fit within this definition. And he could have furthermore taken the definition for obscenity and otherwise crafted or, or given uh, guidelines to the uh, war, uh, FBI agent as to what could be seized. And then Mr. Seraph said, we could have then taken those pictures and we could have established what was electronic mail that accompanied those pictures. So it, it would have been very easy to just seize 
the actual uh, documents that violated the law. And they didn't do that. And, now, and Mr. How Sarah long does, how long, you say it was a general warrant. Uh, That's but correct. Isn't it limited somewhat by the, the capacity of America Online to, to store these things? Uh, how long does an email thing exist? Isn't it, isn't it erased after a week or? That, or that is a very long, it would require a very long answer. No, it's not erased after a week. It depends on what you, users can keep it alive in the system by redistributing it. Oh, I see. Furthermore, once no one else has used that information in a certain period of time, then the, as I understand it, the, the memory on the computer allows it to be deleted in a uh, as available basis. So you really don't know how long it's going to survive in the system. It can survive for a month. It can survive for six months. So the, the warrant that was issued here wasn't give me the last 10 days of... I think of, it went back like three months. Oh, three months. My recollection. Okay. Right. But it was also just what was in the system. Now also I wanted to point out too, this search was done at night. I refer you to attachment five to appellate exhibit 11. The government has tried to say that this search wasn't done until after Garrett got there. That's just not true. On this particular exhibit, it shows that the, the program was submitted by Mr. Seraph uh, through the computers on 12 December at 0207 hours. Well, that's like two o'clock in the morning. And the warrant itself says uh, in the daytime, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. So uh, I challenge uh, you to find in the record where it says this search was actually accomplished after well, uh, Mr. Well, the Garrett government has conceded uh, that this, uh, in response to Judge Crawford's question, that this was not a private search. Right. Uh, I well, guess they, I, I won't say they've conceded it, but they haven't made a big <laughs> issue of it, I'll put it that way. My point is that... They, they contend it is a lawful search based upon probable cause. Right, but I'm, I'm talking about the general execution of the warrant where it says it will be done in the daytime, uh, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. I mean, there were so many violations in this warrant that to say that anybody but I acted think your client day, could not be heard to complain about that. He might be heard to complain if they broke into his house at 2.02 a.m., but the fact that... No, the, again, Your Honor, with due respect, I'm just talking <laughs> about the good faith issue. I understand. Ultimately, if you find that everything was done wrong, and you're now left with, well, were the agents acting in good faith? I think you have to look at all the mistakes that were made in obtaining this warrant. Even the fact that... Well, I that think, I, from my perspective, and I don't have a clue as to whether my fellow judges agree, is whether or not this is a general search warrant prohibited by the Fourth Amendment, or whether uniquely in the cyberspace arena, if this is enough specificity to allow the FBI to do a search through the material in order to find the prohibited material. You know, like coming into your home to search all of the rooms but only seize the contraband. Is this what this is or is it something else? You see, it, you see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And, uh, so it's a very interesting question. You, you, you present some interesting questions. My time is up. Yeah. Thank you. I've given you all ample time, I think. Uh, any other questions from the judges? We'll take the case under advisement and render a decision as and, and soon as we can. Thank you very much. We'll take a short recess. Uh -huh.